just gives me this look and just walks off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so today, I think we're on 20. I'm going to uh, start with a little meditation kind of based on a, a one word take on, on today's chapter. Do you guys each have a, a single word title or two word title for, for chapter 20? As Jared and I were just saying, they're likely to vary, but still dramatically be similar. Being observing in my book. What is it? Observing. Observing, yep. That's what I have here. Wilhelm had <coughs> contemplation. Yep. Contemplation is how I first learned it, yeah. <coughs> so, uh, pretty simple meditation here, and we can do this. Uh, I guess we'll we'll do it kind of briefly and we'll do it a couple different ways, but the, the, the practice is the same. It's just the focus is different. Um, so first, the, the focus will just be the breath, the breath coming in, the breath being in, and the breath leaving. And I, I guess I should say that the... The, 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 the relationship, nah, I don't want to say it that way, sorry. Um, what we can observe is uh, three things. That's what I'm positing for this. We can observe other and we can observe self. So far, so good, right? So under the rubric other could be every other, some other, that other, one individual other, but however I assemble other, it's just not self. And I can certainly look at the self in terms of portions and aspects of the self, <clears throat> which when I sort of fractally view the self, I'm basically othering myself when we looked at the chapter on war, we talked about other as well. And I would argue that the process here today that I think is recommended by the 20th hexagram is a healthier take on other. And so uh, when we observe, <coughs> we can pay attention to uh, three things. Um, one is other, two is self. Once the other and the self connect or recognize one another, or in the case of breathing, one inhabits the other, then we have a relationship. And the relationship is a third, let's say thing. I, I don't know if thing is a fair word, but, but a, a third uh, place to focus. So we're going to start with a meditation, just observing the breath as it comes into the body, as it resides in the body, as it leaves the body. We don't have to particularly do our best breathing ever, but you're certainly welcome to have a nice posture and do nice, deep, slow, gentle breathing like we would normally do in arts such as these. And what I just want to do is observe it. <coughs> 
not even to get to know everything about it or write it all down or notice mistakes. Just observe it. Does that all make sense? I'll flesh it out as we continue so it'll make a little bit more sense why I gave you some of that prelude stuff. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll just invite you to take a seat, however you're comfortable, and just for some number of breaths, maybe 10 or something like that, 12, just observe the breath. Just let me know when you feel like you're back. Yep, yep. Yeah. yeah back. Good. I think I mostly typed it up there, so. Next, with the breath, we'll do the same thing. But what I wanna do is when the breath comes in, when the breath is resonant within, and when the breath goes out, just observe the self. Ideally here, I'd like to observe the whole of the self, or let's say at least much of the self. I say much of the self because you might have that furiously trying to check off everything on your checklist because they said the whole self, and then your whole focus is, did I miss anything? So I don't quite want that, but just, I don't want it simply to be, uh, I feel my trachea, I feel my lungs, I feel my diaphragm, like a very simplistic 
the self that's pretty much touching the breath. So when the breath comes in, when the breath is resonant within and when the breath leaves, I want us to um, observe our own being through that practice rather than the breath. Otherwise, we're basically doing the same practice. Fair? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Let's try that for 10 or 12 breath cycles or something. Maybe think about let me know when you're coming back. Yep. Yeah. Pixie's here. Bye, Pixie. <laughs> So third and last step, I'm writing them all down so they'll, they'll be in your homework. They probably already are. Um, through some breath cycles, what I want to do, we've kind of established the breath and the being as the, the yin and the yang, if you will, the, the two parties dancing. And we focused on either the girl dancing or the fellow dancing. And now what I'd like to do is, is recognize the relationship, which is this third uh, entity that exists once they are in um, association. So, um, Barbara, let's say, is sitting at home by herself, and she's completely on her own. She's just hanging out in the sunlight, and I'm sitting at home by myself, completely alone, and if either one of us happened to have, I don't know, filled out some kind of census form, we'd be like, one person is here right now, and if Barbara video zooms me and says, hey, Steve, I was kind of hanging out by myself, and you, I bet you are too. 
Yeah, the new math is that there's three of us. There's still Barbara, there's still me, but now there's this relationship between us, which of course people seem very interested in labeling and comparing and changing and manipulating and, uh, <laughs> and so forth once there's that relationship. But the relationship is this third thing, which we can kind of envision as between us. But the math kind of breaks down when you combine two things. There's still the two units, they still reasonably exist, but there's also this relationship. So now when we do our breathing, and this is the harder one, it's the third one, I want you to pay attention to the relationship between the two of you, not simply how you are affected by it, that's still paying attention to you and how you're affected by the breath. But what is the relationship? We don't simply want to have an intellectual consideration of it. Like I give it CO2, it gives me O2 and there's a balance. I learned it in fourth grade. But I want to observe the relationship. And of course it's much more ephemeral, just like when we learn basic arithmetic, the teacher can hold up a couple apples and say, two minus one is one. See how there's one apple left? Like everybody gets it, but the teachers don't keep holding apples up when they teach you imaginary numbers and negative integers and so forth. Uh, the, 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 the metaphors change. So we don't want to practice this next piece in exactly the same way as before, but I also can't tell you how to do it. I can kind of tell you what not, what isn't it. So I'm going to invite you over the next 10 breaths or 12 breaths or something like that to observe the relationship between the breath and the being. So come into a easeful position. Let me know when you're feeling like you're back. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. <laughs> So this is uh, uh, the, the missing component here. Uh, well, first, do you guys want to 
ask or say or share anything? What was I assume the third one was harder than the first two? Um, yeah, I noticed that um, it was more difficult because there was constantly. Uh, I don't know if it was necessarily the ego per se, but there's something constantly want to collapse the observing self and the self self together. And yeah. It's constantly want to be part of, you know, the act, <clears throat> so to speak. That won't necessarily mess it up, I think. Okay. So it's just it might be just a little okay. more sort of mentally strenuous, I guess. But I, I don't think that would necessarily, you know, pop, pop the balloon. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, unless Barbara wants to chime in, I'll I'll just keep yeah, going. I thought it was neat. I mean, you weren't focused on any mechanics at all. It was it just the relationship. I don't know. It put you more. It put me anyway more in the here and now in the present. Yeah. Uh, last time I taught this, the, uh, I was teaching it to a, uh, a religious scholar, and uh, he said, you're basically teaching the, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, you know, you're, you're teaching the, the, the uh, you know, the, the creator, the flesh, and then the relationship, and I said, well, if you say so, I don't know, <laughs> like, but I'm not going to argue with you, but that was interesting, because once he had that sort of access, you know, he was really engaged and felt he kind of already knew what it was and wanted to explore. Um, uh, so it, I actually feel like there's four things to observe, but I wanted to simplify in teaching this. <coughs> uh, once you um, consider that there's another, uh, whether it's true or not, or whether you're trying to convince yourself or rather or rather uh as is the ordinary case we just sort of default to seeing others and self um once you do that that you make the world kind of binary there's self and other but whenever there's binary in relationship you really have three um the Tao Te Ching says from one came two from two came three and you know, three came the ten thousand things and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but I would say that the the fourth thing, uh, not necessarily fourth in order, just we did three, so it's four for us right now. I don't know when it arises. It may arise before self, um, but that's a question of cosmogenesis, I think. So we have self, we have other, and we have relationship, and we, we cannot avoid relationship. If there is others, there's a relationship. Even if the relationship is, I call them strangers, I'll never meet them, that's the relationship, right? Uh, so we have self, we have other, we have relationship, but we also have context. So, so where is that happening? And the context may color the relationship or um, excite parts of it or depress other parts of it. Uh, so I'm sure like if Jared and I met in a bookstore, right, we'd be like, oh my God, you gotta see this. Let, let's go see if they have that book. And let, but if we met at a tournament, we'd probably be like, oh yeah, we, let's go. I'm warmed up, are you warmed up, you know? <laughs> The context, you know, we we might want to try and get away with some push hands in the bookstore now that I think of it, but. Uh, <laughs> Let me tell you about all the times Hannah tells me that's inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's inappropriate there. Where is it appropriate? Uh, <laughs> but uh, the context is not simply like the way I described it, like a bookstore or a tournament. It's it's the culture. It's 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 the time of day. It's who else is observing. It's is this a holy place? Is this a place made for this relationship? Is 
Uh, are people sleeping nearby? Uh, you know, is it raining out? Uh, whatever, you know, am I in a boat and it's moving? I, I don't know. So the context can be sort of cultural, it can be temperature, it can be um, language or expectations, it could be just what we know about the physical place we're in. Um, and so we can't just say that this expression of the relationship is good or bad or appropriate or not appropriate. We have to understand context in order to answer that. <clears throat> So even if you think of the kind of worst example of a relationship expressing itself, you know, if we zoom out and say, well, this is what happened in hell, you might be like, oh, well, I guess, I guess that was appropriate there. We didn't tell me that, but I guess even though it's a horrible thing, that's actually what's supposed to happen, I guess, you know. Um, <clears throat> so this is something that I do in push hands all the time. It's how I teach Ting Jin, which is that I need to be listening to myself, you know, oh, that's starting to hurt my knee. I certainly need to listen to the other person. They have a lot of fajin going on. They seem unsure of their lower back. Their feet are too close together. Um, I have to be aware of the relationship. Is this friendly? Are they trying to lull me into a false sense of confidence? Are they trying to sneak something on me? Uh, are they nefarious? Um, and then the context is, you know, you know, is that their teacher watching? Is my teacher watching? Are we in a middle school? And it wouldn't, even though I need to slam this guy, it wouldn't be appropriate to do it here or whatever. Um, so often people just do tingjin and they practice it with like, I'm touching and I feel that they want to do rollback. And that's kind of the end of what they feel. And they miss the contextual clues, which we're all very good at sussing out. It's something we do all the time just in terms of raising our voices or tucking our shirt in or not, or asking for seconds or not, or uh, speaking with authority or not, depending on the context, um, acting first or acting last, depending on the context, um, shutting up, depending on the context. Um, we're really, really good at doing that, but it often happens kind of in the backseat of our brain. So we don't particularly think about it too much unless we're in a new or uncertain kind of situation, then all of a sudden, okay, what's the culture here? What's expected of me? How does this, you know, how do people behave in this temple? What, what are the rules? So <clears throat> those are the, the four things to tune into in terms of observation. Um, and I think they're all kind of unavoidable. And I think most people don't pay attention to most of them when they're actually trying to observe. Um, any questions or comments or am I going on? No, that's pretty good. I like it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I wrote an article some years back where I introduced uh, that idea to uh, to the readers. And, you know, so I kind of wrote out the whole thing in an explanation. I, Maybe it's inside Kung Fu. I don't really remember now, but it, that's out there. It's probably a thing you can search, you know. Um, <clears throat> so uh, contemplation, uh, which is, uh, I used to teach a class for many years called Taoist Contemplation. And um, so it's pretty near and dear to my heart, this idea of contemplation, which you may kind of think, well, observation and contemplation don't really seem like very similar words. They seem like they could live side by side okay and they wouldn't fight, but why is one translation observation and one, uh, you know, one commentary is um, contemplation. And what I would say is that in contemplation, I, um, I take the symbolic representation of other inside myself, probably we could say brain or mind, right? It, you know, I don't eat it, but it, it, it comes into me that way. And that's the only way it can come into me is as symbolic representation. 
maybe I have some knowledge or wisdom about it. Maybe I have very little. I just have a sense of what I've seen. Um, but uh, at any rate, I do my best to take other inside self. And the practice there is to observe other within the self, which we might call rumination or um, contemplation, is to observe other within the self and observe the self while other is within it, because that's where I do the observing in here in the mind. And there's a there's a challenge there because you know the map is not the territory, so it can be very easy to think that I know this thing. I've I've sat here in my scientific lab in the uh, high Arctic for over 47 years studying elephants in these books. <laughs> and you might say, okay, but well, have you ever smelled one? Like, have you ever felt one? You know, there's, there's a difference between the reality and all of the knowledge. It doesn't mean it's unhelpful to have one or the other. It just means that there's a risk of kind of missing that there's more in the world than is symbolically represented in the mind. But the representation symbolically within the self is, man, that's an amazing thing that we can do. I mean, that's something we're built for. So we also don't want to make light of it or say it's not useful. It's just not all of it. So when I take the symbolic representation of other into the self and I observe the self and I observe the other and I observe the relationship to those two, right? This is why, um, for example, um, let's say before Barbara logged in, Jared and I were talking about, um, you know, we were having a really deep um, you know, kind of a political philosophical uh, discussion about uh, what women need. And we're both pretty smart guys and care about it and do a lot of reading and thinking. And then we both kind of nod our heads like, yeah, we got it. And then Barbara logs in and says, hang on. Clearly you guys are missing some stuff here, right? <laughs> and, and so, when I say that we bring the symbolic representation into other and we observe other as best we can within the self and we, rep and we also observe ourself and we observe the relationship, that relationship is really important because to some extent, Jared and I are going to be fixed in a point of view about women because of just where we are, where we come from. And similarly, Barbara would do the same thing thinking about men. Or, or, you know, pick, an, I just picked men and women because it's um, accessible for us. But the relationship to it is its own thing. And it's, it's unavoidable, although it changes and it morphs and it grows and it can be manipulated. It's, it's always a facet. So even if we're all taking on the symbolic representation of, let's say, a table, and that's what we're all thinking about and ruminating over. Um, you know, the fact that Jared fell off a table yesterday is gonna change how he looks at table and Barbara and I won't have known that. That's his context. That's, or I should say that's his relationship. So as well, there's the context within which this is happening and within which this symbolically represented thing exists in the world or exists in our world or exists in our relationship or exists these days. So what I would say is that when we have contemplation, what we're doing is we're practicing all the facets of observation in a practice. But again, the map is not the territory. So even when we practice all of the facets of observation, and we do it sincerely and well, and perhaps for a long time, it's still not the same as touching the elephant and smelling the elephants, but it's not unimportant. 
I'm not saying the only thing that's important is touch and smell the elephant. I'm glad that people touch and smell elephants and know them in that way, but I'm also glad that there's veterinarians that have microbiology degrees and study things and develop a serum to help the problem that the elephant has when it has asthma or something. I don't know. So hopefully I kind of made my case. I don't know if I was just too wordy trying to get you to see how contemplation is like the full-throated practice of all the types of observation in one practice. Yeah, it makes sense. I see it. Sounds like Pixie agrees. I think she is fully observing all the things that she needs to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Barbara, did you uh, have a follow up there or did you, uh, you could hear all that and make sense of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think if you just, it seems like observation is much more casual than contemplation. Mm. Unless, I mean, well, we, when we observe, we do it in a more casual way than. Well, I, I think that the term observation, we could probably say we could make it a little bit less casual in terms of the term that we chose. But I think if we just think of it like the way a scientist would say the word observe, we wouldn't think of that as casual. You know, like a scientist using the word observe, that's like a, a pillar of their practice is, you know, very uh, particular types of observation. Well, that's true, but then scientists actually, they can't help but put themselves in it even though they don't want to. Okay. Yeah, it's the, the biases are a, real, are a real challenge, but I was thinking of science in, in terms of the, the sort of platonic ideal of it, <laughs> as opposed to particular examples of of particular scientists, but just the idea of observation in science, I would say is not casual. It's, it's very, you know, prescribed and circumscribed and, and, and carefully described in, in, uh, in your study. But I'd certainly be open to a term besides observe that didn't allow for us to hear it the way we casually share that word with scientists and say observe, mm -hmm. you know. But I've always uh, wrestled with the idea that in the Tai Chi classics, they say, gaze left and look right. And, you know, I've interrogated a whole bunch of people, like, what's the difference between gaze and look? And why is it different on one side than the other? And uh, most of them just change the subject. <laughs> so I, I, I've had like 30 years of uh, disappointment with that particular interrogation. <laughs> So, um, what I'd like to do is introduce you to a, a Taoist contemplation practice, since I think we have some time. Um, generally, so this is just like a very sort of simple uh, comparison. If we look at somebody doing meditation, we're gonna expect them to have like, you know, good posture and little to no movement and, you know, easy breathing. You know, that is like, okay, that person looks like they're meditating. If the posture goes, they might be more napping than meditating. <laughs> um, and, you know, if, if the breathing isn't really kind of quiet and gentle, then they may, might be just kind of waiting for somebody or something, not really meditating. And um, if we come upon somebody that's contemplating, we're going to expect to see them being fairly still, fairly good, let's say structure, posture, you know, alignment, something like that. Um, and kind of gentle, deep, easy breathing, right? 
In other words, from the outside, contemplation will look like meditation. You can't really tell the difference. But on the inside, and this is like a general idea here, but it's, it's fair enough to expound this way, I think. In meditation, we are trying to quiet the mind in order to do the particular meditation we're doing. To have few thoughts, one thought, no thoughts, less often thoughts, don't chase her thoughts, but it's, uh, it's supposed to be a thoughtful thoughtlessness when we practice meditation. However, in contemplation, what we're interested in doing on the inside is having thoughts, but not willy-nilly hither thither thoughts but constructive um gently held followed uh keenly observed thoughts but it's not a bunch of arguments and it's not like you wrestling over am i supposed to go to that thing or not and you know having a, a fight with it so much of a Taoist contemplation looks just like meditation and much of it is just like meditation, but I'm not really interested in having my brain not involved. I actually want my brain involved in contemplation, but that doesn't mean that we just let our brain do its own thing. We want to kind of bring it to obedience school before we invite it to the practice. So, that makes sense, right? You're kind of all with me there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, what I want to do here is, is practice word association. You're going to do this on your own unless you want an example. Um, and think of the word association as uh, maybe kind of occurring in a river or a rhythm so that you don't linger too long with any word neither do you really feel too hurried either because you want the word association to kind of come from your subconscious and easily you don't want to really think and have a few choices and then pick one so you're really kind of jumping down the rocks of a river. And if you stand on one rock too long, you're gonna lose your balance. So you have to keep moving. And you almost jump before you see the next rock. So, I'm just going to, I'm gonna give us a word to start with. So we all start in the same place. And I think what I'll do is I'll give you a little example of how it goes. So you can just kind of watch me. Of course, I'll be speaking. You guys will just be silent because it'll look like meditation. So I said table before. So I'll just say, you know, table is where I'm starting. Just now table, just the idea of table isn't particularly exciting, interesting, or important to mankind. It's pretty objectively just kind of mundane. So that's a good starting place. <clears throat> so I say table, and for me, I just picture four legs, and that makes me think of bipedalism. So I think about bipedalism. Now I'm thinking about going from four legs to two legs and thinking about how the organs hang differently. So I go from table to bipedalism to organs. And I was just happened to be studying the stomach yesterday. So for me, I just, I think stomach next, right? So I go for, for me, and I'm going fast here. I might, you guys might kind of linger a little bit until there's an obvious place to go. And it might go a little bit fast. So I go table, bipedal, organ, stomach. Then I go to cow because everybody knows they have three stomachs. So I go to cow. And then I learned something when I moved to this farm about cows and fences. So for me, I go from cow to fence. And from fence, I go to border. 
when I went to border just now, I thought of it like politically, like a political border, as opposed to, you know, the border, uh, you know, of a picture on the wall, for example. And for me, and probably for a lot of people, a political border is kind of uh, charged, right? The idea of a political border, particularly if you're thinking of a specific border. So maybe you're thinking of uh, fugitives or barbed wire or um, something or wars or, or something. So once I get to border, for me, I recognize that that sort of charge, that's not mundane and it's not table or organ. <clears throat> so then I rest in the idea of border and I just sort of explore the idea of it. So I think of it in terms of fences. I think about it in terms of nations. I think of it in terms of people crossing a border like a, a migrant. Then I think of it in terms of um, people uh, needing to have paperwork to cross borders. And then I think of it in terms of armies ignoring borders. And then I think of it in terms of natural borders like rivers and and continents as opposed to just one that's drawn on a map that there's no physical indication. And then I think about it in terms of uh, uh, tourist shops that are just across the border. And then I think of it in terms of taxes and people that travel the border to save taxes because they live near a border. You see what I'm doing? I'm just kind of circling that border idea. And I, I just said a word or two about each, but as soon as I said taxes, I just had like a whole flood of ideas about that and visuals. I, I couldn't say them all. And then I, when I went to the barbed wire, I could picture guard towers and walls and gates and you know double fences. And I just said barbed wire, but I could picture a lot of different sort of things that fit that category. You guys all follow me? Yes. Yeah. So the, so the practice with the contemplation is kind of to trust the subconscious and just go from rock to rock in the river until you arrive at something that's clearly charged. And then try and be anchored there, even though your thoughts can vary and kind of see it from different angles, but you're anchored there. I, I don't go from border to armies to... Uh, you know, to, to, to fighting, to, to, to warfare, to military history, to libraries, to, you know, the printing press, to Gutenberg. I, I didn't do that. I just stayed with borders and I just explored that word as my anchor. And that contemplation practice can be something I find my way to, I find my way to the border and then I spend my 10 minute, let's, what looks like a meditation right there. How many different angles can I see it from? Can I explore any of those without moving on from them and away from border? Because that's my practice is to really consider border, my relationship to it, what it is, who I am, what the context is. And I just changed a bunch of context there when I talked about tourist traps and armies and whatever else I said, you know, migrants and so forth. Everybody got it? Yeah. I believe so. I, I find it a really invigorating practice. <clears throat> so uh, uh, give us a word. And the word is wheelbarrow.
All right, I'll invite you back here. Oh, all right. How are we doing? Pretty well. Yeah, that was intriguing, very. <laughs> yeah. You want to share with me where you ended up? Yeah. <laughs> okay, when I thought of a wheelbarrow, I thought about one wheel. And then I thought about a uh, unicycle and pedaling and it, if you're on a unicycle you had you have to keep pedaling to keep your balance and then when i got to balance that really whoa everything right uh, first I thought about was balancing a checkbook then i thought about things in my own life like balancing what you want to do and what you should do and if there's discipline involved. And then I thought about an incident that happened to me this past week. I was doing something I wanted to do, but I also wanted to do something else. But I I think I'm I'm very hyper focused. Yeah. Could be good, but it could be bad. I mean I was doing Sudoku. I was so and I was so engrossed in this Sudoku puzzle that I missed my Tai Chi class <laughs> um, and I, but I wanted to do that class because I love it too, you know, yeah. and uh, then I'm thinking, oh, I'm too hyper-focused, like, uh, why did I forget, why did I, you know, spend so much time doing a stupid puzzle when I could have been doing Tai Chi, and then I, I guess I was down on myself a little for being hyper focused, but then I thought, yeah. well, if I wasn't as hyper, if that wasn't part of me, right? Would I ever be intrigued with math? I mean, math, it's more, it really isn't, but but you have a, you haven't, you 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 can't really fudge as much in math as you can in other things. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you want the right answer. Yep. Uh, That's great. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, it, is that a fault or it's not a fault? It's just me. I'm very, I am hyper focused, I think. Yeah. People can talk to me. And it's not that I don't hear them. It's just I'm thinking about something else. So yeah. I have to repeat themselves. Uh huh. 
I can focus on what the RAS is talking about. Yeah, it allows, it allows you to examine your own personality a little bit. Yeah. But I think that's valuable right there. You know, just the, that self-awareness, you know, even if you don't land on some judgment, you just have self-awareness, you know. Hmm. I didn't think I'd be able to do it. I mean, you know, I, I didn't think I'd be too good at it, but it, it really came about, you know. Yeah. Um, how about Jared? Do you feel like sharing where you ended up? Sure. Um, like an anchor word? Um, I actually got to uh, my only student I've had over the past year. Um, he's my friend's son. Yeah. And, but like, would you like to hear the chain at all? It, yeah, if you want to share it, yeah. I try not to, you know, pry because it can be personal, you know. Um, so I was thinking, you know, wheelbarrow, and then I was thinking about how uh, one of my fo more fonder memories with uh, over the summer was I was with my uncle, and he ordered way too much gravel for his, his garden. And uh -huh. so what I did most of that summer was wheelbarrow gravel from the driveway to the back of the yard. <laughs> and he, he has like, I think like half an acre or so. So it was, yeah, and, and he ordered like a ton of gravel and he was trying to get like a quarter ton. So yeah. <laughs> that's what I did that week, that, that, that month. <laughs> um, and then I was thinking about uh, the, the, the teeny tiny little wheelbarrow we have here at my home. And I was thinking about that a little bit, and I that chain to where we keep it. We keep it in the garage, and the garage is where I've been uh, training the kid lately. And I noticed that that was the charged point, so I was starting to think about that. Um, he had recently wanted to take a test, you know, a test for his next sash. Yeah. Um, and Chris wants the kids to have sashes just so they can have like you know distinct goals to work towards. Sure. Um, and he did great on everything except the one thing that he needed to pass. <laughs> and I felt really bad about letting him down because I know he'd been working on this for a while, for a long time, but he just got the jitters as soon as he was in front of a, a, a camera. Yeah. And so I started thinking about that and, you know, how do I, you know, training him? And I was thinking about, uh, some of the, uh, kind of like a teachable advice Chris gave me and that kind of expanded right. and stuff like that. So I thought that was kind of a neat chain. Huh. <laughs> that's Sorry. very, that's very, very cool. Yeah. And I'm sure that in your own time, we're limited time here, but you could really settle around that anchor idea, uh, you know, for, you know, a whole day, even if you're not, you know, only contemplating or settle around it for like, I'll come to that anchor point and I'll contemplate, let's say for 10 minutes, then I'll meditate. And then I'll come out of the meditation back to the same place and I'll contemplate anew, you know, let's say refreshed and revitalized, but also just kind of like a new take on it. Um, um, so it, it can be super productive. I recommend doing it with like a notebook near you because often when you're done go oh, I have a few things I need to write down <laughs> yeah so um I I I typed it into your homework the the meditation but I think also just practicing the this basic contemplation chain is um really wonderful and productive so I'd encourage you to spend some time with that All right, on. All right, I'm going to have to say good night because we're late, which makes me late for my next session. Mm -hmm. I, I do thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, it was quite fun. I really appreciate it.